Hi everyone in cloud computing and welcome to episode 22 of the Cloud Computing Australia show with Brad Nelson and the world's number one cloud industry expert and thought leader David Linthicum. This show is sponsored by Nelson Hilliard, cloud computing recruitment specialist placing great people in cloud, IoT, fintech and AI. This week we're excited to have as our special guest Katrina Dow. Katrina is the founder and CEO of Miko, a world leading data independence startup in the emerging personal data economy. Katrina speaks globally on privacy and and data innovation and currently serves on two IEEE standards working groups, co-chair of the Personal Data and Privacy Committee, which is part of the Global Initiative for Ethical Considerations in the Design of Autonomous Systems and the chair for the new P7006 standard for personal data artificial intelligence agent. Hi Katrina, hi Dave, a warm welcome to you both. It's exciting to have you on the Australia show this week. Hi, Brad. Thank you so much for having me join. And hi, David. Yeah, it's great to be back. Great to have you on the show, Katrina. Thank you. By the way, Brad, yes. um, in the United States, we say privacy, not privacy. And we also say aluminum, not aluminium. So uh, I just want to get that straight. Also, solder versus solder, which is a, uh, a uniquely Australian way to say that. I noticed that when I was in Australia uh, last week. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. I'm gonna work. I'm gonna work on that one because there's a couple of things that I say differently to Australia, like data and and yogurt and stuff like that. So in England, we say we say yogurt, which is obviously the correct way of doing it, and and obviously data is is what I feel the correct way. Whereas I'm completely wrong here. So you know, I'm uh, I, I'm I'm forever on a daily basis being uh, you know having to stand up and take ownership. <laughs> It's okay. As an Australian and split my time between the UK and the US, I have a babel fish in my ear and I can translate both of you. <laughs> Excellent. So I think I've said privacy a few times on that, but I can say privacy. I just wanted to make it, make it known that uh, we have a better way of saying stuff than you. <laughs> okay, All now right. I see how this is going to roll. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I oh, know it's really we have great fun. We have great fun um, on and off the camera. I thought we were still rolling. I can't believe you stopped. No, no, we are still rolling. Okay, good. I'm keeping this one on the. I'm keeping this one for the blooper show reel for uh, for for April, Dave. Okay. <laughs> we don't have a blooper show reel, by the way. That's not something we do. We don't. <laughs> there are no outtakes other than the ones that end up on the floor. Okay. In this week's show, we are talking about Facebook is making changes that will prevent non-European users previously under the European laws from being protected from the GDPR regulation. What does this mean for the cloud privacy within Australia? I think that first question needs to go to you, Katrina. Thanks, Brad. Well, I think it's interesting um, that we, we have this scenario right now where 1.5 billion um, users of Facebook were in the Irish cloud. and. Um, we understand that that's Facebook's uh, corporate headquarters, and obviously that was originally a cloud decision that, that followed their corporate structure and probably their tax structure. And so you have to ask the question, why would you move 1.5 billion customers from uh, Ireland and the protections of the general data protection regulation, the, the increased rights for customers in that region, back to California, um, unless you were very concerned, A, about um, what implications that has from a cloud compliance point of view, B, the cost of that regulation, and C, that you had done the numbers to look at the associated corporate tax write-off or comparison to be back in the US versus a lot of the incentives that were originally in place um, in Ireland. So what does that mean for Australia? I think there's a few things we're learning here. Um, cloud is territorial. We're now starting to see, you know, what was what has been built for the last decade as this um, sort of stateless space that, that can improve the way that we can uh, process and and um, and manage information is now starting to have boundaries, geographical boundaries, tax boundaries, regulatory boundaries. Uh, Australia is an interesting place because we have strong privacy regulation which most Australians are not aware of. They're not aware of their rights. It's not quite GDPR. Um, and we culturally sit somewhere between Europe and the United States. So there are some things that we've bothered, that we have borrowed that are very European in terms of digital rights for citizens. 
And then there are some business practices that are very American. And what we see here in Australia at the moment, I think, is, is some tension between which way both of those things may actually land from, um, from a, a very clear cloud strategy perspective. Yeah, I, I, number one, I appreciate for Katrina brought this story to us, and I found it fascinating when I read it. In fact, it's the topic of my blog, first blog this week on InfoWorld. So I stole that directly from you, Katrina. I'm just kind of admitting that on the show right now. But, you know, ultimately, this is about costs. And so this is about, uh, in essence, Facebook trying to save some money uh, longer term in, in building uh, infrastructure and not having to deal with compliance issues and things like that, more so than it is you know, them trying to skirting the law. But, you know, the reality is, is that international companies and cloud computing uh, providers are going to be an instance of this, are going to end up making decisions based on regulatory pressures in certain areas. We have privacy laws in the uh, in, in, in Australia, upcoming stuff in China, as you were aware of, Katrina, and then, of course, the GDPR stuff, which is going to be invoked toward the end of May. And when you get into this, and I've been talking to the press a lot about this over the last you know, three or four weeks as GDPR kind of comes in for a landing, is this ultimately means additional resources that are needed to, in essence, stay within compliance. It's not necessarily running afoul of the law. It's pretty easy to comply with the law, but you're going to need some people with processes and personnel and tool sets to make it happen. So I, I think the uh, cloud providers, Facebook's kind of the first instance of that, but you know, anybody else that is going to be impacted by it is going to make decisions around the dollars. And I, I think that uh, it's to be expected. Yeah, and I, and I think one of the one of the things in terms of that cost offset is um, for those that are uh, familiar with uh, the General Data Protection Regulation or GDPR as it's called, um, the maximum fines are 4% of global revenue. Uh, so it's not revenue in country and it's not revenue associated with a breach. Um, or 20 million euros, whichever is the larger. And so what we, what we I think, are going to see, as Dave said, that um, we're, companies are going to start to assess, okay, the cost of infrastructure, the cost of compliance, um, the cost of business model innovation or delivery in different parts of the world, and start to look at, well, what is the compliance regime that is most aligned to either our existing business model or how we want to continue a business model or how we want to innovate our business model. So the interesting thing for Australia, particularly because Australians are nomads, um, whether that's from a business point of view, whether that's studying, you know, we finish our education and the first thing we are on an aeroplane. And so for a lot of Australian companies, whether or not that's financial services, whether or not that's telco, um, whether or not it's travel related, the minute we land in Europe, those service providers, if they're processing data um, in Europe on behalf of Australians, they'll also have those regulatory requirements as well. So this is a really interesting time from a cloud architecture point of view, because it's almost um, that we have to say, well, what's the processing regime that fits the service delivery and then how do we manage that from a cloud architecture point of view to make sure that we're not putting the company at risk in any kind of vulnerability yeah it comes down to compliance challenges that are really kind of going to be a core challenge to cloud computing over the next 10 years i kind of see it as a core as the wild card in terms of uh, you know having a lot of architectural planning, technology planning, cost planning that really needs to go into this stuff, and and to, to be you know right now uh, in going out and working with clients, it's probably 25% of what I do, and it's probably going to go up to 50, sometimes 70% in some instances because I'm dealing with not necessarily the technology, which I'm very good at, uh, and everybody's going to be good at with technology, and with enough money and time, I can solve any problem with technology. But having to map the technology into the regulatory compliance things is always a wild card because, number one, they, they seem to be misinterpreted a lot and uh, they're, they're always changing. And number two, the tools are evolving over time and we're finding cheaper and better ways to do it. And then the regulations change. We have to change the tooling. And then also it's really kind of the desire to put this regulatory volatility into domain and make it kind of a fig configurable approach, which is really what governance and security is all about. And that takes a lot of time and planning. And so it's fairly scary to the um, 
it, corporations out there that are moving into areas where they're going to be heavily heavily regulated regulated going forward. But I think that all as all areas of the United States, including excuse me, all areas of the world, including the United States, are going to be dealing with heavy regulation of the next ten years. It's just going to happen just because of the, the the data issues and the privacy issues, and everybody's kind of demanding it. And so they're going to elect people who are going to promote it. They're going to go ahead and change the change the laws based on what they're elected to do. Uh, and it's just a foregone conclusion. No, I, I, I agree, Dave. But, and sorry, Brad. And I, I think the interesting thing for the last decade, um, the race has been to get as much data as possible. I mean, that's been the that's been the promise of big data. Um, I think this decade, it's going to be the liability of having too much data. And I think what that's going to do is it's going to create um, if you like, a, a, a new breed of, of superstars in the architecture space that, that will be able to look at cloud infrastructure, cloud architecture and say, look, we can, we, we can process the information compliantly. We can um, uh, manage um, the risks appropriately. And we can also support uh, the business to continue to innovate, to be customer centric. Um, and ideally very respectful of how data is collected and processed. Um, and I think that's going to be the dawn of a new era, um, but, but I think it's going to present um, some technical challenges and therefore this will be an opportunity for a whole new breed, I think, of, of architects in terms of solving these problems. That's a very good point. In fact, if I could just jump in and add something to this, uh, there's actually a, a pub chain in the UK, a hospitality chain called Witherspoons, I think it is, uh, and their CEO has made the decision to delete over 650,000 email addresses just based on the fact that he is unsure of where that data has come from and how compliant it is. Uh, and I think he stated loosely around these words that he'd rather start from zero uh, and have data that's clean and uh, you know, does not form into that category of uh, being sued by the GDPR. So yeah, it's a real, a very brave move, and I think there's a number of companies taking that move. How, how just an add to that as well. There's the, the final question I'd like to finish on, if I may, is that the the impact to Ireland from this point of view. How do you see that impacting the economy within Ireland of this this mass data exodus? Because there's going to have an impact on the the economy and and how that's going to. Be, I would have thought. And also, do you think this is a, t a tidal wave now of of the the first big mover is is Facebook? Do you think other tech giants are going to be removing their data to avoid that compliance issue? Uh, I'd like to put that to Katrina first, and then to you, Dave, if that's okay. So, so I think, Brad, there's a couple of really interesting questions in there. First of all, Ireland was able to reinvent itself and reinvigor. I was in Dublin uh, just a couple of months ago in, in sort of one of their tech hub spaces. And, you know, it's hard to distinguish whether or not you're in Silicon Valley in some parts because, you know, all the same companies are there. And the tax advantages were there. Um, a great generation of young people that were interested in working for large US-based firms, um, the tax uh, incentives. And so I, I think there will be an impact, absolutely, there's no question. Um, and particularly when you look at infrastructure that supports 1.5 billion customers literally disappearing overnight. So, so there, there will be downstream um, consequences there for sure. I think, though, the, the question that we find ourselves in right now, and, and I, it's too simplistic to go United States, Europe, and draw a line down the middle because obviously Asia is in there, Australia is in there. But let's say we were, we were just drawing a line down the middle right now. You have very different data practices. You have Facebook that has assessed um, risks associated with staying in Europe. So the converse of that is, does that represent opportunities for European companies that build that compliance, that customer centricity, those data rights into their business models that like um, Weatherspoon say, OK, we're going to sort of start from scratch in a more um, transparent and trust based way? You know, where is that going to take business models in the future? And I think for the next few years, it, it's going to be an unknown. But the interesting question is, does trust, transparency, and um, customer centricity ultimately lead to uh, better business practices um, and uh, 
in evolution of digital business models or um, will the avoidance of compliance continue to drive stock price, share prices, share shareholder return? And I, and I think right now we don't know the answer to those two things, but it's an interesting experiment because we're really literally going to see two parts of the world go down very different paths. Um, and there is a lot to be learned, not just from the technology point of view, but also society. You know, what does this really mean for society? and the way that um, people collaborate and participate with the companies that serve them. Yeah, fantastic. I, I really I agree with you on that one. Absolutely. Dave, what, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, just real quick. I, I think it is going to be a, a contrast uh, in terms of uh, uh, regulatory avoidance, which is going to occur uh, with a lot, especially the US-based companies that are, that are going to be more cost motivated and EPS motivated, earnings per share motivated. And then I think it's going to be some normalization in terms of the regulations. I think some of them are actually good ideas. Some of them go a bit too far. And I think over time, there's going to be pressure to normalize that and reform some of the regulations to be a little bit more, um, or to be a little bit more in the line where they think how people are dealing with data regulations so they don't blow all the businesses you know, out of the areas where they're regulated. And so we're going to see some normalization on one side. We're going to see some more aggressive use of, uh, of data privacy on the other in, in terms of how we're going to be self-regulating and, and then how we're going to regulate the regulators in terms of uh, adjusting the laws based on uh, on what the businesses desire. So it's going to be, I agree with you, it's going to be an interesting, you know, two or three years as we kind of battle this all out and come up with something that's hopefully of an advantage to the people who are owning the data, which is what we're protecting. Yeah, and I, and I think also for Australia, um, you know, if we focus just on Australia and the challenge at hand from a cloud point of view, it's not quite GDPR, but it's the open banking regime. And so right now we've got some recommendations that came from the Farrell report that came from Treasury. Um, we've got the banks responding. We're in the middle of the Royal Commission here in Australia. We've had some very senior heads roll last week in relation to customer practices that obviously um, are connected to customer information, customer data, um, customer breaches. And so I think if we if we narrow this down really to what, what stands in front of us from an Australia point of view, getting back to a customer-centric design around business model, um, models that actually underscore trust and how that is reflected in the technical architecture of product, cloud, business model delivery, you know, that's really what's on the radar for Australian um, companies right now and never more so than financial services. So whilst we will have a very interesting global um, uh, perspective in terms of the way these things are shaping out, as David said, we, we have on our own home ground some really interesting challenges that are not so much data related, but they're around whether or not customers um, can trust the services they're receiving. And ultimately that's gonna to touch technology and, um, and service delivery. 100%. Well, thank you, Katrina, for being part of the Australia show this week. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been uh, awesome. Thank you, Brad. Thanks, David. Yeah, and thanks to you, David, as always a pillar of the show. Thanks for being a part of it. Always glad to be here, Brad. Thank you, Katrina. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thanks everyone for watching. We hope you enjoyed watching this week's Australia show. Um, you can get hold of Katrina on Twitter, actually, so you can follow her, which is at Katrina Dow. That's Katrina with a Y. Uh, and she's also, you can follow the company at Twitter as well, which is at Miko underscore me. Uh, you, can, you can check those out. I'll make sure there's links in the description box below. David's on Twitter, which is at David Linthicum, and myself on Twitter, which is at Nelson underscore Hilliard. So thanks for watching. Remember to like, subscribe, comment, and share these videos with your friends and your families and friends and colleagues and all the other people that need to watch it. And also you can get us on the podcast weekly as well. Thanks again for watching.